Welcome to Over the Falls podcast, episode number 36. This week, we sat down with Ben Lake. Ben Lake is applied Cymru politician, serving as the Member of Parliament for Ceredigion. We obviously discuss politics, his current roles, stress, mental health, and everything in between. We hope you enjoy. All right. Ben Lake, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Welcome. I want to go... Um, Back to the beginning and start with your journey into politics, if we can. Sure, yeah. So, what drew you to politics? Well, I probably don't have a very good answer to that, um, in that it's not a good reason to okay. be into politics. Um, I always had an interest in sort of, uh, you know, current affairs, I suppose. You know, in school, I'd, uh, in six form stuff, I'd, yeah, I'd watch the news, I'd read a bit of the paper, that type of thing. But um wasn't party political. Um didn't have much interest in sort of uh, the punch and judy of, of Westminster. Um, <laughs> then I went to university, um, studied history and politics, and so got to learn a bit more about the, the party politics of things and, yeah. and the history of it. And um, I have to be honest, you still had no interest really? uh, whatsoever. Um, there, was some, there was some uh, people in, in, in uni who would sort of stand for union offices and would go and do the sort of campaigning and the votes. And I'll be honest with you, I used to despise the day of the election uh, for the uni, uh, sort of union positions. And I hope <laughs> I'm not offending anybody, but um, at my uni, it was always the case that they'd be pestering you. You know, you just want to get your lecture. You just yeah. want to go to lunch, whatever. And there they'd be, uh, oh, have you been to vote yet? And and uh, I may or may not have lied a few times to a few candidates saying that I had voted for them. Um, <laughs> it's easier that way, probably. It's easier. It's, easier. <laughs> it's the best way to get... Uh, actually, that's a tip for everybody who's listening as well. If you want to get rid of people on the doorstep, just say that you're going to vote for them and they'll, <laughs> they'll leave. <laughs> I'll use that next time I see you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they will leave yeah. you alone. Um, uh, but yeah, so I, you know, history was... Although I did history and politics, history was the sort of... Um, Big interest, and um, and after graduating, um, came back home. Always wanted to come back home, um, so back home to Lampeter, yeah. and um, just did a bit of odd jobs. Really, you know, as many graduates, you know, I think I applied for well, about fifty different positions. You know, nothing going, and but I was quite happy. You know, I was, I was doing a little bit of um, ad hoc sort of um, history research for. Like TV programs and radio programs, and then filling in a bit of bar work, but yeah. down in Lampeter, um, and also a bit of work in the uni there, in the kitchens. You know, it was, it was fine, it was great. Mm-hmm. But um, I think as time wore on, um, having been away, seeing how many opportunities there were for for young people and graduates, um, southeast of England in particular, I, I grew a little bit more bitter about the fact that it seemed that most of the opportunities, even in Wales, were in one corner. Um, of of the of the country, and yeah. um, I was mourning about this to Mam one evening, <laughs> and she said, "Well, look, stop mourning about it. Do something about it." Yeah. And I think, okay, well, what could I do? And uh, I thought I had this bright idea of, well, a lot of jobs. You know, if you had a decent internet, you could do them basically wherever in the world. Yeah. And um, I remember writing then to oh, um, yeah. a few of the political parties um, with, you know, I didn't. Looking back, it was quite embarrassing, really. You know, who the hell did I think I was? Mm. <laughs> but I think, you know, look, we really need to improve uh, broadband um, connectivity. Um, and it could be a way of uh, attracting more people to stay in the area or come back to the area. And um, <laughs> they probably they might regret it now, but uh, the, the local Plaid Cymru sort of responded and said, oh, OK, look, we'll have a discussion about this. Come in. We've got our conference in Aberystwyth coming up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was 2016, I think this was, um, or maybe 2015, and um, come along and let's have a chat about it. So I did, um, wasn't party member, wasn't interested in any uh, particular parties really, um, and uh, started that conversation, um, I was quite you know, impressed with the way that they responded to it, they, they took it on and um, they started raising it down the Welsh Parliament in Cardiff, I thought, oh, okay, there's 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 worth in this engaging with this demo you know this democracy stuff yeah. um and uh from there then got more interested started volunteering um had a bit of work experience in uh the plaid office with ellen jones in, in Aberystwyth, and then um just before uh but late 2016 um an opportunity came up for i think it was two days work paid work um that'll be based in in the same in cardiff and um 
started doing that as a researcher, really, policy researcher, and, and really, really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. Really enjoyed it. Um, back and forth. Um, so I always wanted to be back home for the weekend. At that time, I still thought I could play rugby. <laughs> um, <laughs> How old were you then, Ben? Just so, so that would have been, I was probably 22, 23. Okay, so 23, young, sorry, 23. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and it was great, you know, I learned a lot, a real lot, and um, learned a lot from some politicians, you know, the way that they did their, they didn't look for arguments, they tried to look for compromise and common ground and stuff. And um, and then by the time there was a snap election in 2017, um, it wasn't expected and, and uh, definitely the party wasn't um, prepared, you know, in terms of... Um, the general election, um, there was nobody for, for Cerdigion. And um, they, they asked me actually a couple of times and I said no. Um, looking back, it was probably a lot of fear it was more than anything. I was going to say why you say no, yeah. I, I think it was fear, okay. you know. Um, I'd always been, even in, in, in sixth form, I was comfortable with, you know, the, the written work, um, you know, the, I was comfortable with books, reading, you know exams to some extent um but when it came to more of the being on the stage um being sort of the face of things i really wasn't that confident um i remember like in sixth form um one of the most nervous bits uh, of my sort of school life in sixth form was when i needed to like speak to the other six formers you know in sort of more of a public setting I, yeah. i'd be terrified actually it's funny isn't it because it's, it's like one of my questions for later on actually is about public speaking and it must be well, it's really hard. It's one of the biggest fears for people around the world. It's like, it's right up there. So one of my questions was, is how did you get good at it? But obviously you weren't good at it initially. You were scared like the oh, rest of us. I'd be so scared. Uh, again, you know, 16, 17, 18, even into uni, you know, I'd trip up all my words. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd know what I want to say. Yeah. Like if you want to try to be friendly with the boys or something, I'd know what I wanted to say but I wouldn't be able to deliver it. You know, I was quite uh, quite a poor public speaker, if you like, uh, and not in sort of just the formal sense, just more of a, in a social setting as well. I'd, yeah. you know, trip up, have a fantastic witty line to say, but then fail the delivery, you know? Um, and, and I think, looking back, it was more of a, a real sink or swim um, when I did finally agree to, to stand. Um, and almost there was something in my mind just switched and I, it's not to say that I don't get nervous um I still do and I think that's important to be a little bit nervous keeps you you know on on, on top of your game as it yeah were. it keeps you on your toes doesn't yeah, it? yeah and that's yeah. important to be lax a daisy if you're just like ah oh, that doesn't really matter <coughs> exactly yeah it's like stress <laughs> isn't it? yeah yeah you know but um yeah. and it was something about it and then now I uh, even if, if it's you know maybe a, a public meeting or something and maybe there's a hundred two hundred people or whatever um, there, there isn't that same debilitating nervousness that used to really afflict me when I was just with a group of friends. Mm. <laughs> um, that's gone. And I, I think it's just more of luck, actually, that um, something in my mind just switched and touch wood, it hasn't sort of kind of gone back. You know, I've yeah, if it's you it. taking that role, though, that, that in itself has helped you, isn't it? Maybe if you didn't take that role, take that leap of faith and represent Kerry Digion mm. might never have happened or certainly later on in life maybe I don't think it would have you know and no. at the time when, when I was tossing up whether or not to actually put my name forward in my back of my mind I was like well you know what it's too soon you know <laughs> I'm, I'm 24 it's too early I shouldn't and um, somebody told me uh, very simply so look if you think you can do it opportunity doesn't knock twice so it's now or never, and there will always be a reason not to. Yes. So, um, and I uh, was very lucky. A couple of close friends of mine, I had a chat with them, and uh, they said, look, go for it. Um, might not happen anyway. So mm. don't worry. Just just go for it. Uh, enjoy the experience. Learn. Um, and uh, you'll never then have to look back in years gone by thinking, ah, oh, I wish I'd tried. The regret. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so... That's what it, how it was, really. Um, it was more of because I knew what I wanted for, I suppose, if I'm brutally honest, you know, the Lampter area first. Yeah. And then I could say, well, actually, it's, it's more applicable to a, a, you know, a broader area. And that's what really, in a very negative sense, I thought, well, we're losing out here. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
there needs to be something happening and I think there's a contribution I could be making to that rather than perhaps a more traditional route in where you know from an early age, right, you're this party or you're that party. Um, it just didn't happen that way for me. What, what, what sort of positives and negatives have you found being so young in politics? Because it's yeah. not an old man, it's not a young man's game, as they say, is it? No. It doesn't so, seem to be. It doesn't seem to be. No. To, so have you found it hard at times being, the well, you were one of the youngest, I'm sure. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was. I, I'll be honest with you, the the... The election in 2017, um, you know, the, the, res- the final result was sort of declared about six o'clock in the morning, I think it was, after the, the, the election day itself. And uh, after a few media interviews, I got back home just before lunchtime. And I was shattered by this point, so I just mm. went to bed and I thought, right, I know I'm exhausted. I've been up, you know, yeah, about 30 odd hours. I, I, I should sleep, I couldn't. I, I really couldn't. I remember distinctly to this day this feeling, this weight on the stomach. Again, oh, okay, what have I done here now? This is a responsibility here now, and mm-hmm. I gotta, you know, start working. And um, and that sense of uh, dread, in a way, uh, the sense of responsibility weighed on me uh, to the point that I don't think I had a full night's sleep uh, until it was. I think it was Guy Fawkes' night that first year. So the election was in June until the November. I, I just couldn't sleep through the night. Stress. Wow. On it. I, I just couldn't. Yeah. Um, wow. And it was always that, this is important. You know, I, I got to, I, I have to not mess up. Because yeah, it's yeah. not just something, I think for the first time in my life, I felt, well, it's not just on me. You know, if I mess up, there are consequences for other people. Um, and so that's been tough. And in, in different times since then, um, the pandemic was a big one, um, especially in the first few weeks uh, of the lockdown. You know, that feeling of, goodness, you know, people, well, it ranged. People couldn't uh, leave their homes. They'd be worried about their health. Businesses would, would, were at risk of going under. Mm. Um, that really weighed heavily. Um, and if it kind of fluctuates then. You know, there are, there are times when you think, right, okay, things are under control um, and you can feel yourself being able to think clearly clearly, and, and kind of identify maybe solutions and, mm. and ways to drive things forward. But there are other times when, I'll be honest with you, it's, it is stressful and you feel, or it is easy to feel that you're, you're drowning. Um, and being a young guy, I think, in Parliament, you had to... It wasn't so bad in Westminster, I have to admit, uh, because there'll be plenty of negative things I could say about Westminster. One of the positive things was that they, the other MPs didn't really care about your age. Uh, I have to say that, hand okay. on heart. They That's were, quite good. Yep. Yeah, they, they were. All, I, th- I remember one guy telling me, um, well, uh, you're here, you've been elected like the rest of us, so you're just as good as, as the rest of us. So, of course, yeah. You know, it doesn't matter what age you are. Yeah. Um, and I have to say that was a common theme. Um, there were other times when, occasions you'll perhaps try to raise a, a case that somebody's brought to you and they want help with an organization and there were times when organizations um were a little bit dismissive and i thought you know who's this young pup um what does he know and we mm. can you know run rings on this one um and that was disappointing but what i found it was quite a healthy challenge for me then to be well actually i'll show you otherwise Good way to do it, you know. Good, you want good a response, bit? yeah, yeah. A little yeah. bit of uh, healthy motivation and challenge. That's good. Um, now I have to say, I don't get that. Um, partly, I think because oh, it's been six, well coming up to seven years now, which is I don't know where the time's gone. But <laughs> um, so I think people are a little bit more accepting of well, okay, you know. He's been elected. He's done his time. He's a veteran. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's done his time. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's got the receding hairline to match. You know? <laughs> That's why I'm wearing a hat. <laughs> a lot easier. I should hold that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, it, it can be tough. Um, I think uh, for what it's worth, though, I reckon it's a little bit harder for a younger female in politics. Really? Yeah. Because yeah. um, Mary Black um, was uh, one of the other young uh female MPs when I was there, uh, when I first went in, sorry. And then in 2019, there were two or three uh, female MPs elected who were in their like mid-20s. 
And um, I remember they were getting a lot, sadly, elements in Westminster as well, a bit more dismissive okay. yeah. um, than they were ever to me. And I, and I think it's because I was a male. Um, yeah. I'll be honest. Yeah. I, I think that's what it was. Yeah. Um, and then also, when it came to sort of uh, the sort of protests and, and well, when things were, you know, emotionally charged and people were angry, <clears throat> I think this, I think most MPs will agree men get off a lot easier mm. than the female MPs. Um, you know, I can probably count on one hand, you know, the number of death threats that I've had. But if you ask any female MP of any age, and they've probably got, well, they could probably count on one hand the number of people going to jail because of the abuse they've had, you know. It's That's it's really a big it? difference. Oh, it is. It's, um, I don't know. I think it's always existed to an extent, but it's getting worse. I guess people come to you for, like, guidance, help, advice, but then they also look at you for blame as well. Do you get a lot of that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think... Um, it's. I think it's part of the job. Mm. So um, you know, you you are in a very privileged position to be representing people. So you know, you will be honoured by invitations to join loads of lovely things. You'll be, you know, you'll go to the carnivals, you'll be to the school plays, you'll be able to meet businesses and wonderful work. So there are a lot of good aspects to the job, and and you know, you get those invitations because you're the MP. So highly, highly privileged. The reverse of that, then, the other side of the coin is when things go badly you're on the hook for it, even if on occasions it's not actually your fault. You're not responsible for it, but you are the the person who gets blamed. And, that, and that's always been the case for, mm. for MPs. And, it, you know, you have to take the ref for the smooth. I know it's cliche, but you do have to. I think what's difficult now is that there are so, so many problems. Um, it can be, you know, the weeks will go by where you just think, right, I'm under the cosh, you yeah. know, weeks will go by and it's it's and i have to say in in Kerrigion, i find people are very fair and and uh, measured in their criticism and, and concerns you know it's not like unreasonable um stuff um but at the moment it's a lot because things are you know things are bad out there it the is world's crazy, crazy. Uh, and <laughs> there's so many different subjects that people can come at you with locally and national uh, like yeah. yeah nationally and things like that um one thing I was going to ask you is, it seems to me anyway, why don't many young people go into politics? I mean, I hear a lot of people studying politics, but it doesn't seem that that many people kind of go into politics. Yeah. Why, why is that? Or why does it seem that way? Yeah, I, I think you're right, though. Not many people do go into it. Um, I think, from my experience, I think there's... It's still not very clear how you get into party politics and therefore... Uh, be in a position to stand because I think yeah. there will be some people who who are so interested in politics from an early age that they will find the party structures right they, they'll they'll join a political party at the age of 16 or what have you and then so those sort of avenues are clear to them because they're they're in the party they know how it works um, but for most people they might not actually get that um, uh, political uh, until maybe in the mid 20s um, and if they haven't been beforehand, it's, it's a bit of a closed world, actually. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, you know, it's, mm. it's not easy. I mean, it's a question that I've been toying with myself, uh, just my own party, about, well, when it comes to, like, selection processes, um, should we go back to an idea that they floated in America where you have an open sort of selection so that anybody, they don't have to be a member of the party, can put their name, names forward for, you know, yeah. for a cause? And, and I personally think, I think there's a lot of merit in that. Uh, because you'll broaden then um, the opportunity, uh, and you'd hope then as well broaden, you know, the um, uh, range of candidates uh, that come forward for politics, and through that have younger people. Yeah. Um, the other thing as well, I suppose, can't shy away from the fact that as a a, a role, it, it does have. I think personally. <laughs> I think it's a role that you can do when you're young um, and then when you're older. I think in, the, in in between years, you know, when you're perhaps raising a family, I really tip my hat off to any MP who does it because the, the nature of the beast means that you basically live in two places. You know, you're, you're constantly on the move. Yeah. Um, it means that if you're home, you know, you can't really socialise um, 
well, you can, but it means that, for example, when I'm back with the boys, it's a bit of a joke, really. They they ne- they never really want to send me up for for the round because they know it'll take an hour <laughs> for me Someone's to come back. Someone's going to catch you in the bar, <laughs> Ben. <laughs> yeah, one thing, <laughs> Just two things. things. Yeah, yeah. Two it, things. I was, was going to ask that as well. It must happen all the time because you're very recognisable, you know. So it's. Most people must come up to you all the time, especially if you're sitting down with your wife in a restaurant or something. Yeah. I bet you sort. Of, but again, I guess that's the, the yeah. nature of the beast. That, it's the nature of the beast. Yeah, and I actually think that it's. I I still see it as a positive. Um, yeah. I'm. I, I feel so quite privileged that people, I feel feel comfortable enough to come up and ask. Um, whether it's just ask for help or ask to have a, have a chat at another point or something. I'm lucky because I know there are other MPs where perhaps they wouldn't do that. Um, but then they'd have a, an absolute slanging match on social media or something against them. I'd far prefer it that people come up and feel, oh, look, sometimes they're difficult conversations. Um, and I think that's important for democracy, that they feel they can have that, you know, polite, but but challenging, tough conversations with the yeah. representative. Because I know, for just my own personal experience, from those conversations, you know, in the rugby club where somebody's taken me to one side and, you know, had a good debate with me, um, or supper with the wife and somebody's had a quick quiet word on the way out it's made me think again about things and and then i'd like to think from that interaction you're able to better represent them yeah and it's that personal exchange is so so important and as i say i found in Caradigion everything's always healthy and constructive um where sometimes it falls down for other mps and social media and, and it, that's where it crosses the line, I think, sometimes from being constructive, healthy, good challenge to being just downright abusive. They're and just place to be yeah. arguing on social media or Twitter or something like that. You don't. Yeah. People can hide behind the keyboard as well. I mean, someone, I mean, I'm sure there are some brave people who come up to you and they kind of let, let you have it maybe in the pub or whatever, but at least it's face to face and things like that. Whereas people can be quite cowardly online and they yeah. say pretty horrible things. And, it, and it's not really like they don't have to be accountable for it. They, they, they can just have a weird username that's probably numbers and nobody that's can it. trace them from it so like anonymous um so yeah i'd much rather talk to people face to face as i'm sure you yeah. you would you know and also what you find as well when it's face to face even if you know you can't agree um you have a good discussion and i i have to say touch wood every time there's been a challenging one we we cut apart on a, on a positive note that's really good you know because we find something in common and and, and that's where social media is harder to do that you know you, yeah it, it almost it amplifies the the discord or the disharmony between people, uh, whereas that actual normal physical interaction, yeah, face to face interaction. I'm sorry, um, you are able to say, well, look, we don't agree on this, but mm-hmm. you know, we're both supporting this team in the rugby, or you know, it can be course, something yeah. as simple yeah. as that. Yeah, um, find a common ground there, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and so uh, that's one of the things I find when you know, week in Westminster, I come back. And Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays are out and about. And they recharge me big time because you get that sort of energy from people. You're walking around. Like t- this morning, I having a few chats on the street uh, down in Arbor and things being raised, but also then a few jokes. And, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. oh, you boyed up. The worst bit for me was lockdown when, you, when I didn't have that. All I had was the social media and emails. The negative online stuff. And yeah. Yeah. We were talking about this before you coming on here, but it's such a strange time, wasn't it? <laughs> well, no one knew what was going on. No. no. I Did mean, you know earlier the most? A little bit. Um, I remember I, the sort of late February, I think it was, yeah. 2020. Yeah. Um, I remember being invited um, along with the party spokespersons for all the parties in Westminster mm-hmm. to a briefing with uh, Matt Hancock because he was yeah. Secretary of State for Health and um, another health minister called Joe, Joe Churchill. And uh, we knew it was going to be about um, COVID, mm-hmm. but at that point it was still unclear. There were rumours. I mean, I remember there were rumours. And I had friends asking me, because a few of friends from home were in London, and saying, is it true the army's going to come in and, and, you know, force the lockdown? You know, there was a lot of concern. and So we knew it was something to do with COVID, but then what it was, it, they were briefing us on the um, emergency legislation. Okay. Um, and uh, you know there were people around that table who were far more experienced than me in, in you know politics, and when they were going through some of the emergency provisions that they were going to enact, but hoping that they didn't have to use them, poor people's faces sort of dropped, and the blood went from everybody's faces. You know, it was, um, I think, you know, when it was things like 
mobile crematorium and all that kind of stuff. Thankfully, that never happened. Um, mm. But it was really sobering. And and then I know we were then sort of told about, I think maybe it was half a day um, before the lockdown was announced. So it wasn't much before. But what it was quite interesting was that there was one of the things, because nobody knew what to do. It was uncharted mm, territory. Totally. It was, totally. Um, they realised, well, we need to have some MPs in London, otherwise we can't pass laws. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So it makes sense, right? Yeah. Um, so in that initial period, they said, rightly so, they'd, need, they'd have a handful of uh, younger MPs or MPs with, without caring responsibilities, London MPs as well, just to stay back um, and not to travel back and forth so that if they needed to kind of uh, come in and pass a new law. There was, I, I can't remember how many, I think it was maybe 50 <coughs> odd, um, they're able to vote and to pass law if needs be. And, and for the half period, actually, party politics went out the window. You know, it was just, <laughs> how do we get through this? Well, exactly. Yeah. You, know? you didn't know yeah. what it's going to be the next day to the next. It was no. such a strange time, wasn't it? Absolutely. And um, I remember on, on my birthday, I think it was 2021, um, because many people still didn't come back to, sorry, many MPs still didn't come back to Westminster for, until much longer, much later. And uh, so what happened was when things were being voted on, they'd give their proxy vote to an MP. Mm-hmm. And on the, I, on the 22nd January 2021, I held uh, the proxy votes for Plaid, um, a few SMP, all the Liberal Democrats, a handful of Labour, and a few of the Northern Irish MPs. And so on paper, I held like the third largest party in the United Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> and as I walked through the division lobby in Westminster after doing the vote, the, the Labour and the Conservative whips, because there weren't many of us back, so we actually got to know each other quite well. And they uh, said, ah, there we are then, uh, you know, big day for you today. Uh, it's your birthday and this is the most relevant you'll ever be in your life. <laughs> It's all downhill. 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 Yeah. <laughs> to get better than this. Oh, no. but, uh, but yeah, so it, but it was crazy times, yeah. you know, in, in the COVID. And um, there were good things that came out of it. You know, I think uh, the importance on digital infrastructure and, yeah. and in, investing in it really came through uh, loud and clear. Um, but I think also, you know, there were clear downsides and, and we're probably going to be dealing with some of the consequences for years to come I'd say definitely yeah you know? mental health certainly yeah. massive that, that's yeah. a huge one yeah you know like a tsunami I think they described it as or, or it would be a tsunami when everything kind of settled down and I think that has come to fruition a little bit isn't it you yeah. know yeah. Un- unfortunately yeah so yeah what right. um so in your role in Kerry then Ben what's like <laughs> The, the best thing about it and some of the worst things about it? I reckon the best things about it are that um, on a you know, weekly basis, uh, we, well, all MPs do this, but um, you hold advice surgeries where people can come in and, and ask for help or, or guidance on things. And um, it, it's an incredibly privileged position to be in when people can turn to you for, for help and advice. And... Um, I had one this morning now for a um, surgery in, in Abba, and uh, it gives you such a buzz, honestly. When you're able to give advice or help that solves a problem for somebody, the feeling of, well, like the euphoria, I suppose. If you could bottle it, <laughs> you'd be a very rich person. Um, it is the best feeling in the world when you, when you actually manage to help solve something for somebody. Um, and, and, you know, it's... We're lucky you're able to do that on a regular basis. It doesn't always happen. You know, yeah. sometimes the efforts are in vain and, and the problem persists and you can't get, you know, change a decision or um, settle something for somebody. Um, and that, that really sucks, mm-hmm. um, especially because I've, I've got a great team um, who helped me with casework and, and they, it hurts them as well when, when you try and work on a case and it doesn't come through. That, that's... Uh, downside but the, the definitely the highlight is when you're able to help yeah um and uh the, the i suppose then another you know uh highlight and a, and a plus point to it is that mm-hmm. you get invited and you get to meet so many uh different organizations and people and and it's in a way it's made me love my because you know i'm a kind of boy anyway um 
Uh, well, in fact, actually, when I was a very small baby, I was in Southgate. Um, Were you? But, yeah, Harvan. So just, just. Oh my gosh! Up the road. Yeah. No way. Um, <laughs> so my dad was in the police, is he? So it was a police ah, house back police then. House. Yeah, mm-hmm. of course. So, uh, that's, ah, makes sense. So there was, but um, it, it's actually through the job. It's made me appreciate and admire the people and communities of Kerrigan even more. I know that sounds corny. I know it does, but genuinely, there are some amazing stuff happening in this county that. Uh, perhaps because we're so far from Cardiff and London, doesn't get the recognition that it deserves. And it's a, your task then to try and project that and, and to shout about the, mm. uh, the, all the good stuff. And But that is something I think an MP's role is unique. I don't think there are many other roles that will give you that exposure. And, and you know, from a week to week, it's a completely different experience. You know, there is no typical week really yeah. um, in the job. The downsides then, um, as well as when things don't go to plan uh, and you're not able to crack, you know, that particular case, I suppose there are wider things that, you know, you know hurting your home communities and there's little prospect of things changing. So at the moment, you know, well, I don't need to tell you guys, I mean, Ceredigion, West Wales, where depopulating um it's an aging society yeah, that brings yep. its own strains yep. i mean investment in public services is sorely needed but not forthcoming mm-hmm. um and, and it's things from buses to ro- and roads but also important things like social care yeah. um education ambulance times is something i was going to ask you yeah on as in like do you think it's just underfunding to the NHS? Do you think it's more than that? Uh, a combination of it all? What do you think is happening with the NHS and waiting mm. times and things like that? I think, in my opinion anyway, and I, yeah. I could be wrong, but my take on it is that as a society, if you like, across the UK, yeah, we've, I say we've, the political class then, have dropped the ball big time when it comes to long-term planning on things yeah. and also appreciating the importance of investing today but not finding the benefit until maybe until five, ten years down the line. Yeah. Now, that wasn't always the case. I mean, Victorians are always kind of heralded as, you know, they built the sewers to last. And in London, for example, they're only now upgrading the Victorian sewer. I mean, it was so yeah. far. They, they really yeah. looked to the future. But to more relevant points, you know, when it comes to things like in the UK, we still... We've invested about half the OECD average in public services for the past decade or so. Yeah. Um, now, that has an impact on the quality of roads. It has a quality of digital infrastructure, uh, trains, um, whereas they are quite sort of hard economic infrastructure. Yeah. But also, when it comes to the number of beds per population, we lag behind the other rich countries of Europe. Mm. Um, we, when it comes to then things like, as you mentioned, social care, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think a big part of the problem we have with the NHS is that we're very good at treating people in the NHS, but we're not then able to discharge them. So if you like, the throughput isn't there. So it's, it's true in Canada, as it is across the UK, there are a lot of people who uh, have been cured or, or treated who are still in hospital beds that could actually go to step down care um, or the care settings, but we haven't then recognised that social care needs to be properly invested in. Hmm. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, whether we're an ageing society or not, it would be important because on any given day in, in Pronglais, there are beds there that are occupied by people who are fit enough to be discharged. Um, but can't because there's nobody, no way to, to discharge them to. Yeah. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that some then of the problem, not all of it, but some of the problem then with ambulance waiting times is that you have ambulances waiting to discharge people into hospital, but they can't because the beds aren't ready yeah. because we haven't been able to discharge the, you know, the medically fit to be discharged from hospital. And there isn't a quick bullet, silver bullet to solve that. No, so it's actually a really complicated thing to solve, I think. You know what I mean? And it's not one moving part either, no. I don't think. No. And and I think where we where the, our politics is, is failing at the moment is there's not enough preparedness uh, to talk about these things, realizing that for example, if we were to make a decision today that social care should be brought far closer into sort of our thinking on the NHS, so that we, we recognize it as two sides of the same coin. Uh, sorry, different sides of the same coin, even. 
Uh, and if we don't have a, um, a working, fully functioning social care sector, it's going to impact on the NHS. But to fix that, you're going to have to put in uh, the investment in terms of facilities, yeah, step down beds, uh, but also the workforce, train pe- more people up, mm. um, pay them better. Yeah. And these things, one, cost money, <coughs> yeah. but two, will take time. So if you make that decision today, you need to do it knowing you're not going to get any credit for it, but it's for the good of the nation. Yeah. And that's where I think our policy is falling down. It's more about what are the quick wins. All oh, right, get your name in there. Get your name yeah. there. You know, yeah. where are the quick wins? Um, same like with when it comes to investment in in infrastructure. You know, you could be the one making the decision on say uh, rolling out fibre broadband uh, to everybody <laughs> in Ceredigion, and then hard to reach areas they get satellite, right? But that'll take two or three years, so you're unlikely to be the one that gets the credit. But that, sadly, in modern politics, that stops people then. Hmm. It's not sexy, is it? To no. have, to have no, it's not. On the thing, oh, I'll tell you what, we're going to sort that out in about eight years. Yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> and then yeah. we have it. Okay. <laughs> so, so for, and I'll give you an example then. We run in this vis- like vicious circle where there are things that if we had taken the decisions when they first arose, we'd now be benefiting from them. Yeah. So like, oh, yeah. uh, so I'm not going to be partisan, but like the Chancellor did his, uh, his uh, budget last week. And one of the things he mentioned was that uh, to increase productivity in the NHS, it was going to go paperless, right? Look, there is clearly a benefit to digitizing things and, and, and uh, making the most of, of IT, right? There's no doubt about that. Mm-hmm. This idea of going paperless, right? I'm lo- old enough as a politician to remember that being announced as a big policy in 2018. It never happened. Yeah. So it's whilst I welcome the idea, yeah, of course, let's let's make the most of, of IT and, and any sort of gains that we can get from it. But unless you follow through with it, it's just another catch line. There's on a headline on the paper for maybe a week. Yeah. And then it's re-announced, what is it, six years later on as a new thing when it, ha- it isn't. <laughs> no. And that's really frustrating because yeah. a lot of the things, I think in the UK, we are suffering a bit of a managed decline at the moment. And it's because... For maybe twenty odd years, we've fallen into this trap of always looking for the glittery new sort of shiny thing, yeah. short termism, without sometimes thinking, you know what, we need to be thinking more of public services and right where do we need them to be in ten years' time, mm-hmm. and what are the measures, the investment needed today to make it happen in ten years, and it's it's not it's not as you said it's not sexy. <laughs> No, I think that's another like, reason why you need young people to come in because you might have politicians towards the end of their, like in the twilight years of their yeah. career, and they think oh, I'm not even going to be here to see that yeah. in 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 ten years' time. And then you need like young blood coming in, thinking, well, I want to change this in my lifetime, yeah. even if it takes ten years. Um, a question I was going to ask you as well, Ben, was how well aligned politically were you with Plaid when you went in? Because I'm I'm mm. sure you you couldn't have been going in thinking, I think every single <laughs> one of these things is for me. Is in like how well aligned were you politically? Yeah. I think the core values were there. Yeah. So um, you know, I, I really, really felt things like I think that when it comes to economic development, I was fully subscribed to Plaid's view that it shouldn't just be, you know, the cities that get the attention that i really like obviously living in rural rural wales i'm going to like that so yeah Yeah. so that was always appealing to me and and this idea that um this should be more of a an outside in approach so so it's it's something that's debated a lot in westminster when they're talking about hs2 for example yeah the the old line is well if they started building it in manchester birmingham uh, and the leeds thing it will get done because they want to make sure it connects to London. But the problem is we started in London <laughs> and we won't even reach Birmingham, I don't think. Um, yeah. So that, that, that type of um, value, I suppose, was fully subscribed. Um, and then also, I'll be honest, on the, on the constitutional side of things, I really felt as though that the UK could work better. And so the constitutional change aspect, I was always fully signed up to. Um, but having said that, there are points of disagreement and continue to be, of um, course, you can't with, be totally with the aligned. party. Um, but I would say, I would say that probably to put a percentage on it, probably seventy-five percent there when I when I joined and then stood. Um, it's a pretty high percentage. 
Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd say it was about seventy five percent, and and it's something similar now. You know, they're they're probably not points of disagreement now. They're not sort of um, major, major. It's more of well, I agree on what we're trying to achieve, but I disagree on the means to get there. Okay, to it's jump those. on Luke's question then. Yeah. What what would you change? Ooh. Come on, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think that. Um, I think that Plaid could be uh, contributing more as a as a as a voice on the political stage to these longer term issues and, and problems that we're facing because the areas that we're privileged to represent are on the sharp end. So uh, to pick on another example of you know demographic change, aging society, um, Plaid have historically represented sort of the western coast of, of Wales more than other parts. Um, and those are also the areas where we've seen quite a lot of demographic change in the last 20 years. Um, in the last 10 years, the census that was announced uh, a few years ago, Kerry population dropped by 5.8%. It's aged, so I think 26, 27% of the population now of Kerry are over 65. So when we talk about, right, how do we make sure that the public services to support that, um, firstly, support an aging society, and then also, how do we ensure that there's enough money for public services just to keep going, let alone how do we try and attract more young people to stay here or to come back here? Mm-hmm. You have to think long term because these things happen over a long time and you're not, it's like a, an oil tanker. You're not going to be able to, to make a, a U-turn on a sixpence piece, or a sixpenny piece. Mm-hmm. You know, you need that longer. And I think Plaid can, could do a real benefit to, uh, UK and Welsh public discourse if we were a little bit more kind of assertive on those arguments mm. avoid a little bit more of the short termism that that is so tempting for any party um but to be a bit more boring I say boring but a bit more considered and say look there are long term problems here that if we don't start addressing them now they're going to get even more difficult you know climate change is a good example of where um, you know, if we'd started to, to decarbonize 20 years ago, the measures required of us to get to the target were less intrusive, easier to take. The longer you leave it, the more drastic and harder it becomes. Yeah. And I think that that way of thinking about things needs to be applied to, yeah, changes population, <clears throat> but also, you know, provision of public services in, in rural areas. It is, you know, it is more challenging than if you have, you know, concentrations of population where you can perhaps deliver you know more of the education from fewer schools and stuff mm-hmm. in rural area you can't do that um i remember police forces another one a weird example perhaps to use but you know custody suites in in uh, police forces in a rural area like david powis which i appreciate it's not just carry but you know the entirety of mid and west wales um they have to have more custody suites per head of the population which cost a lot of money to staff and to, to run than say the Metropolitan Police in London, they have the economies of scale, mm-hmm, of um, and unfortunately we haven't been very good on the UK level. Neither have we down in Cardiff either. I'll add, <laughs> been very good at appreciating that issue and thinking about how do we compensate. On the one hand, there will be downsides to providing a public service in a rural area. In the same way as well, there, look, there are challenges in the city and urban areas as well. It's not you know the land of milk and honey yeah. down there. Yeah. But it's all, far too often a one size fits mm. all. And because you have more people in the more urban areas, that one size tends to fit them better than the rural areas. Yeah. You you mentioned climate change there, and I think sometimes you have to like prioritize sometimes, is in like so I obviously care about climate change, but when you've got people waiting hours and hours and hours for like an ambulance and then you also want to do something for like the future of your kids with, with climate change. But then you've got people like China and India and Russia, and we are literally like to say we're a drop in the ocean is, is, is mm. true. W- with what we're going to be trying to do, I just feel like surely we need to prioritize the really important things first. Mm. But then I, I understand it's difficult to do everything. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it, it is. You know, and prioritizing. I, and, and I think as well, you've hit the nail on the head. There. I think where politics again needs to improve for politicians to be a bit more open about look, sometimes. There are no good choices. No. You just got a, a, a bad and a less bad <laughs> choice. <Yeah. laughs> um, and, and sometimes mm. it means you have to take it, um, as you say, and prioritize things yeah. that 
if you had you know unlimited resource and and opportunity yeah, you'd do great. everything yeah but you can't can you, no. you know? and that, i think you're right that that's where politicians have and i include myself in that we find it very difficult to communicate it effectively to people um yeah. and that then has a knock-on impact in that public debate then is not as constructive um and fruitful because we're not addressing the reality or the elephant in the room that you know what we can't do everything <laughs> no, and, and actually no, no. the old expression to govern is to choose is is really really relevant today yeah. um so it's a balance you're right and it is. i think at the moment there are few examples where there is a chance to try and uh kill two birds with one stone type um you know there, there's a lot of talk about energy efficiency and um and helping uh, improve the energy performance of our housing stock is very relevant in Ceredigion. Um Problem I've got with current policy is that it doesn't address a very important section of, of the population. Those who are working, but they're just about managing. Um, they might have young families. Um, and yeah, if there was a, a government grant um, or an interest-free loan over 20 years, say, um, to have a few solar panels to cut down a little bit on energy bills or to put in new windows to make it more efficient, yeah. they, they'd be open to it. Yeah. Um, but asking them to foot the entire bill for it is just, it's, an, it's not going to happen. No. They no. don't have, people don't have that disposable income. Um, and you just think of somewhere like Caradigion, where as a county, you know, the, the typical um, energy performance of our buildings is pretty low because they tend to be older buildings, you know. Um, yeah, they have got grants on oil, oil boilers. I think they've got decent <laughs> grants for that. Yeah. They've also got decent grants, but nothing for like um mains gas at the moment or it doesn't seem like there's, no. there's many grants out there for mains no. gas boilers eventually that'll come i'm guessing but i hope so i mean i yeah. argue for it and also i think that they need also realize that there will be people who won't fall under the criteria of getting a full sort of um grant due to age or, or income yeah but that shouldn't mean then the government if it's serious about you know tackling and reducing some of these energy emissions from from housing yeah which, yeah, great, let's do it. But why not then have, you know, uh, interest-free loans for people that can they take out over 20, 30 years to kit out their houses so that they're really efficient, hmm. you know? There needs to be some incentive there sometimes. Needs, it's it's not, not just the incentive of, like, say, pollution and things like that. And it's not that that's not important, but then when when some people might be struggling to, like, feed, feed their kids or something like that, that's always going to take priority on some other And it things. should. Of course it should. You know, and, and that's where I think where we could be doing better as, as as a UK is to identify, well, look, I visited recently with, I'm on the Public Accounts Committee in Westminster and we visited the UK Debt Management Office and it was an incredible visit. It really opened my eyes on a, I think it was a Tuesday morning, rainy, uh, turned up to this uh, building in the City of London and I think it was between half nine and 10 or half 10 and 11, forgive me, they managed to raise over two point four billion pounds for for you know for UK taxpayers in debt they were issuing out. There was oversubscribed, so I think about seven billion pounds worth of bids were put in for that two point four billion. And these were being borrowed over 10, 20 years. I'm just thinking, well, if we're able to do that within half an hour, why can't we also think and our you know, our ancestors used to do it. Okay, wartime meant that they had to, but they did it, they think like, you know, war bonds and what have you. Yeah. yeah. Well, why don't we have something similar whereby, you know, we could raise, uh, reverse it and raise um, green sort of debt from companies and use that money to offer these long-term uh, interest-free loans to people. Uh, then all of a sudden you open up to everybody. <laughs> um, you can still still keep, you know, the, the grant support, don't get me wrong, but at the moment you're just doing the grant support, um, which is targeted understandably right i get it we don't have you know uh infinite money but you're then not touching a whole section of society who could not only be willing to undertake it but also could then benefit in the interim for reduced bills yeah. and then you're hitting the green agenda yeah. and maybe cap the huge companies that are making like record-breaking profits as well oh. that, that's never going to go oh. down well when, when, when my bills it. never been higher and then i read on the news that say Shell, I'll pick Shell. Record breaking yeah. billions in the year. British gas. Oh, and Centrica. I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Centrica as well. Oh my God. Record breaking. Yeah. They've never made more. 
Yeah. And it's never been more expensive for us. And how, you, how is that fair? Like, well, you know, people are struggling and they see those massive profits. Yeah. How is that? Well, it's not. It, honestly, I don't think it is. No. There's, Shell is a good example. Centrica as yeah. well, British Gas. Um, I was in a, in a meeting in Westminster recently and I'm chair of the all-party group for fuel poverty. Um, and we had Ofgen, the regulator, in front yeah. of us and given us a bit of a briefing about their energy price cap and all this. And an MP asked a very important question about the, with standing charges, you know. Yeah. Personally, I think standing charges are ridiculous because it doesn't matter how much you use, you can be as efficient and prudent as you want, but that standing charge is still going to be there at the end of the day yep. and you're going to be paid. And, of course, standing charges vary in different parts of the country. Mm-hmm. And he asked, you know, how is that fair? And they came back, oh, well, you know, it, it's a different cost for these companies to deliver the energy or the electricity to uh. you. I just and I answer back. Well, look, I'm sorry, but take National Grid for example. Um, they're a private company. They've increased not only their profits, but also they increased their dividend payments to shareholders. Yeah. So whilst if they were, for example, ceasing dividends, going into a deficit, and then saying, look, we need to increase standing charge to cover the cost, there'd be a bit more. I'd have a bit more sympathy. Yeah. But that's not happening. Mm. They're, they're still increasing their profit, increasing their dividend payments to shareholders. And the fact of the matter is, it's the bill payer then, sadly, that's paying twice, not just for the electricity, but also for that profit. Yeah. Um, and it's not fair. You could say as well, the banks, um, you know, in February this year, they posted their record annual profits. And yet, just this week, they've announced they're closing uh, Halifax in town. They are. I've seen that. Yeah, on Facebook and another night. one. Yeah. I think Halifax and maybe one Barclays. other one. Is that what it is? Barclays. Yeah, Barclays. Yeah. But the problem is as well. It's like that's, that's yeah. two big properties in, on the main street in Aberystwyth, which is already empty. with a load of empty shops on there. Yeah. Mm. The no one's taking them. You know, it's it's. Yeah. But I guess that's the same with every sort of high street at the moment. It's it's the same everywhere. It's not just Aberystwyth. Yeah. No. No. But no, you're right. It's not just. Aberystwyth. But it's not nice to see. But uh, but it's it's a part. It's it then contributes to that part where. There is a lot of wealth in society. And, you know, the UK, I think it's still the sixth richest economy in the world. Right? It's not a poor country. No. Our problem is that the way in which wealth is distributed, <laughs> um, it's so increasingly concentrated in the larger corporations, whether it's your, your energy companies or what have you, um, that it doesn't feel like the sixth richest country in the world. I'll be honest with you. No, it's a big gap. No, it doesn't feel like it to me as a really sort of what I would consider like a normal person working a normal job with a youngest family and it feels like I've probably I'm probably earning the most I've ever earned and that's still not a lot of money but it's still the most I've ever earned and I feel like I'm not there's no benefit to it because of how expensive everything else is Mm. I feel like I've got less money than I used to have maybe yeah <laughs> it, it, it's crazy um one question I was going to ask you was about tax as well particularly with larger corporations large like this is obviously difficult to answer as well but why why can't why can't we tax the big the big companies why can't we tax Starbucks why can't we tax Amazon why yeah. can't we tax them I think there's <laughs> a two-part answer to this yeah <laughs> first I think there's a lack of political will to actually Go after it. Is that like they don't want to rock the boat because there's so much money to be made and things like that? Is that what is nobody wants to rock uh, the boat and annoy all the rich? It's, it's like, an element. It's yeah. an element of it. Um, but also when some of the corporations, the fear is always, well, they'll just move their operations elsewhere yes. because they're global companies. They'll. But I put it this way. Yeah, right? but surely it's, they're not going to, even if you tax them like 5%, nowhere near the 20% or 2% or something, mm. and you think like, well, they're not going to like up sticks and take every Starbucks out of the UK. No. They probably still want to have a presence of whatever company it might be, Amazon yeah. or Starbucks or whatever. Just tax them a little bit. I don't know. Yeah. No, no, I, th- I agree with you. There is there is this lack of political will at the moment uh, to really go after them. Uh, I actually, because history is my real passion, I think there are a lot of similarities and lessons to be learned with a situation out in America when uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt was pre- uh, was president, right? And he went after the big oil barons uh, and the railway uh, rail tycoons because they're basically monopolies and things, and, yeah. and the wealth was being concentrated so much. I mean, you just couldn't touch them. And he used then the power of the federal government to break them up, oh, um, right. to bring in a fair. And I think his catchline was, you know, um, a square deal. Square deal for uh, workers and you know 
uh, back then, you know, the working man was the the, the big sort of uh, tagline. But it was incredibly unpopular. You know, he was putting himself out there and, and oh, was being really, really sort of endangered by it. And he, he managed to do a lot of good by tackling them, um, then brought in, you know, the, the proper competition. We've got a similar situation now. I mean, energy is, is I think, the, probably the... the the biggest thing impacting on on people and and organisations. Another thing as well that has floated under the radar a little bit, but I think it's just quite a, just as egregious is the way in that supermarkets. Yeah. Right. Now they will at the moment ninety five percent of food sort of bought from retailers are sold by twelve major sort of supermarkets. Right. Mm-hmm. They dominate the food supply yes. system. Yeah. Um, now, they will compete with each other and they will claim that there's a very competitive market and food prices are low and all that. Okay, fine, whatever. They won't pay their primary producers well, mind. You know, your dairy no. farmer, what have you, doesn't get a cost of production, let alone a profit from his produce. Neither are growers. The, the, the whole system is skewed, right, to these big, t- I think it's 12. Um, and... We have a competitions and market competition and markets authority, which is supposed to be the watchdog, and they took uh, an investigation. And look, I'm not having a big pop at them. The terms of their investigation saw that actually it's a very competitive market, and for the end consumer, the prices are quite fair. Okay, that's that's roughly speaking their conclusion. They didn't look at whether it was fair to the food supply chain uh, uh. And, and the primary. Neither did they look at the fact that actually despite the fact that uh, some food goods and food produce were kept low, others had gone up, such that even your Tesco's and your Sainsbury's, they increased their profit margin in the last two or three years. Now, for me, right, if on the one hand we're saying that energy prices are up and inflation's having a big hit on operating costs, how can it be in a functioning free market, if that's your, you know, if that's your politics, in a functioning free market, how can it be that these companies then are in expanding their profit margins. You know, I, to me, that's a sign of a broken market, actually. Yeah. yeah. And regulators, whether it's water, energy, or the Competition Markets Authority, need to have greater teeth and willingness to crack down on some of these practices. Because, you know, it, it's not right, go back to the energy example, for these transmission networks, the grid companies to claim, well, we need a standing charge to be increased because you know, our cost of uh, providing the electricity has gone up, but then at the same time also increasing their profit margins, expanding their profit margins and dividend payments. For me, it's only when you can no longer uh, you know, afford to pay any uh, shareholders dividends or profits, then you kind of enter the mechanism of, okay, we have to increase the standing charge. Yeah, you know, exactly. And the question, go back to this meeting I was talking to you about in Westminster, a colleague of mine put it way better than I could. He said, at the moment, the the risk and the the financial burden is being placed on the bill payers or the taxpayers, depending on you know the yeah. example, whereas all the benefits, none of the risk, are being placed then on the shareholders and the dividend. And... You have to have an element of, you know, I'm not anti-profit. You do need profit to, to encourage growth and economic yeah, investment, isn't it, isn't right? It? Yeah. But it's yeah. everything in moderation. And when you've got a situation when people are genuinely coming to me, not using the heating over Christmas and exactly. uh, winter, yeah. they can't afford uh, to put food on the table, uh, but they're working, you know, full time. That's when we have to say, hang on, guys, the system's not fair here. There, there is no fair play to people who are, just working hard, trying to make a living. No, very hard. Uh, yeah. The generation you thing's crazy as well. Cause it, uh, you said something then that, that reminds me of it. You're talking about people working full time, whereas now you get, say, like anybody, a young professional couple, say they're both definitely working full time and they haven't got a lot of spare mm-hmm. income, I would say. But then you go back a generation and you could maybe be like a sole provider, have a relatively normal job, I'd say, not not a fantastic job, but just you know, like an average job mm. and you could support a family of say two kids and maybe go on holidays. Yeah. That is just the past, isn't it? That's not, that's no longer yeah. what what's happening. Is and it? the younger generation now, you know, I think 
it, it, it depresses me sometimes, the disconnect, uh, because the experiences of, of different generations are so different hmm. that often they don't actually, and I, uh, this is not to be judgmental on anybody, but they just can't recognise how difficult it is for the younger generations coming through now. Hmm. No, they blame it on uh, takeaway coffees, don't they? That, that, that's why they can't afford <laughs> yeah, a mortgage. No. <laughs> anyway, if only. I mean, you know, like, if, you, if you just take a flask, right? Take a flask to work. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Sandwiches every day. I can buy that 600 grand house. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, oh, that's, but, and, and, and that's, and that's a big issue because there's going to be a point where, you know, gen- generations of people... Uh, who will not have had the, sort of the security financially that previous generations enjoyed or the job prospects or just the quality of life, you know, will then also have to ensure that uh, there is care for the elderly, that they are supported in their retirement. And and it's it's going to be a big issue. And again, it comes back to, it's okay, it's not going to happen maybe for 10, 15, 20 years. But if we don't do anything today... <laughs> I really don't know how we fix it in yeah. 15 or 20 years because it'll all come on top of us. And there, there'll be a generation of people. I mean, this parliament is the first, I think, since the, the war where your typical earnings are lower at the end of the parliament than they were at the beginning. So even through like the 70s, which we're always told was terrible and yeah. really, really difficult, through the 50s, where, yeah, look, don't get me wrong, you still had rationing and stuff, so it wasn't easy. Yeah. But you could expect after every five-year parliament, things will be better. Hmm. However marginal it was, it was better. This is the first one that that will not be the case. It's like going backwards. Going backwards. Oh. Um, oh. Sorry, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit depressing. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. no, it's, but it's no. the reality, isn't it? Yes. No, it um, is. I, I, wanna, I don't want to carry on talking about politics, but I want to bring it back to you, yeah, sure. if that's okay. Um, You've got like a huge amount like on your plate at all times. And I feel like I could ask you so many questions about Kerry and you'd have great answers coming back at me. Um, how do you manage stress and your own mental health? I'm still learning. Mm-hmm. Um, and there have been a few things in the last year that have really, really helped me. Um and, and things that I weren't, that I wasn't doing before. Okay. And looking back, I wish I'd started earlier. So simple things, a little habit every day. So I, I make sure I get enough water. I know it sounds really basic, but prop, you know, sticking to the water, um, limiting things like caffeine, um, that's helped me because I can't really control the amount of sleep I get because the way that the job is, you know, if, if there's a late debate, you could be in bed by one. Um, or you could be in bed by eight, you know, it depends, but you can't control that. So the things you can control in terms of your body, you know, I try to um, make sure that I walk as much as I can when I'm in London. My office is on the fourth floor, so I try to, you know, walk the staircase at least the first time of the day, you know, when I go up, <laughs> uh, rather than taking the lift. Those are the things I've, I've just got a bit more disciplined with that really help my, I feel my well-being better. Mm. Um, but further that then as well, being able to um, almost have there's Ben Lake MP and there's Ben Lake, and so when the things are, are you know it's natural right you know, when negative things are said it it it, it pinches you right it does pinch, sure. mm-hmm. but then I think well that's Ben Lake MP, hmm. you know that person doesn't know Ben Lake, so it's fair enough because Ben Lake MP you know hasn't fixed all the potholes so it's fine for them to have a have a pop at Ben Lake MP, but that's not Ben Lake that's not you know me as the individual. And it's been a long time kind of conditioning myself, and I'm still not completely there to realize that that's the case. And um, there are times then when if I haven't had enough sleep, if I haven't been um, drinking enough water, or also if I haven't like read a little bit before bed, even doesn't matter how late I get in, I try to do a little bit of reading, just a sort of, and usually it's history books, so a complete sort of other world. Um, it helps just keep the balance in my mental health. Um, and over the last year, I've been keeping like a, a daily sort of uh, diary um, with these things kind of checked out. Of, you know, right, how did I get my five uh, pints of water or whatever? Yes, okay, good. Um, and I realized on the weeks where I feel terrible on a Saturday night when things are finishing, on a Saturday night, oh, I'm feeling really bad. I look back and think, well, hang on. <laughs> I haven't been drinking enough water. I've had very little sleep. Um, for me, that's helped. I found that, okay, this is, I don't have to spiral here because I know, right, 
I can control it. I can have more sleep. I can read a bit more. I can listen to more podcasts, things that give me a bit of enjoyment and balance. Um, and, and I found it to be, I would say transformational, actually, because I, I would say in many ways that, that, I've, that I'm, I have more things on me now that should stress me out than maybe two years ago. Hmm. But I was feeling way worse two years ago than I do now. Uh, it's because you managed it. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. From what it sounds like. Yeah. And everything, you know, everything will be different. Yeah. Um, but for me as well, having you know, the, the, I try to keep one Saturday a month where I don't have anything in it just to do what I want. And and it'll be sometimes my enjoyment is going back to Lampton Rugby Club <laughs> and watch the boys play a, a match or something. And that's my like sort of escape. Yeah. Um, and to really switch off for that and you know, not look at the phone, not look at the emails. Um, and that one afternoon keeps me going there for the next month. Lovely. It, it's it's really, really quite um, uh, surprising, actually. It's important, though, isn't it? Because you've got to have your own time. You've got to switch off. Otherwise, someone in your position could burn out oh. quite quickly, I think. Yeah. And I've seen you know, some colleagues in Parliament as well who've, who have. Um, and uh, I, I suppose it's, it's true of all professions. Sometimes, if it's work stress... Doesn't matter how great your friends and family are, talking to them about it doesn't always work. Sometimes you want to work, talk to your colleague because they will understand, hmm. you know, the ins and outs of. They're going through kind of what you're going through, yeah. a bit more, yeah. you know. And and finding that, so I found myself. I, I when I'm in Westminster, I go to the uh, House of Commons tea room more often now, just for my supper, um, because what I find is there'll be other MPs there, and invariably you start talking about. Oh yeah, things are pretty bad at the moment. You know, people are quite angry. You know, I think, oh okay, it's not just me then, and that has been a game changer. Yeah, you're not on your own. Yeah, it's a very small thing, but it's very true, isn't it? We talk about it on the podcast quite a lot. It's like you're not the only person who's having a rough day. You're not the only person no. who's getting a bit stressed or losing your rag or whatever it could be, isn't it? You're definitely not alone. No, in no. the way that you the, think. The problem is though, when you're in that moment, it does feel like you are the only person going through it. <laughs> yeah. Because we both had young kids at fairly similar times, wasn't it? Yeah. We used to vent at each other all the time. Yeah. And I think without Luke at that time, it would have been way tougher. Mm. Yeah. It's good to have someone to vent to. Oh, it is. Isn't it? And also sometimes you know somebody who's not going to... Well, I was going to say not going to take it seriously. That's not what I mean. But it's more like they're not going to blab about it to somebody else. You know, yeah. they're, or they're, they're not, or they're not going to judge as well. I think a judging yeah. one, because yeah. the worst thing ever when you open up to someone, what we use like kids as an, ex- as an example, and you say, ah, oh, so tired, and like a really, really bad the same. You'd be like, oh no, my kid slept 15 hours last night. Yeah. Oh, absolutely fine. <laughs> the worst. I, I'm just using that as an example. Where <laughs> yeah. That's not going to make you feel better. No, basically. <laughs> no. No. You want someone with a camaraderie and you think oh you're going through the same thing that I'm going yeah. through do you know what I mean a bit of a rubbish time that's yeah. right it's camaraderie a lot of it yeah you're right. it is that's like what it is. you're going through a similar thing as me and then you can almost like bond in it and you help each other yeah. get through it if you're going through something something similar yeah so, so you say you like going down to an amateur rugby club what else do you like to do in your spare time eh? I love uh, reading history is yeah. a big I, I have to say I've probably the more the older I get the more it helps uh, and I enjoy it do you read about World War II I do. Yeah. I have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have. I find it fascinating, you know. I've only got a couple of books, but fa- yeah. fascinating. You're right, though. The older I'm getting, because my dad's a massive history fan. Yeah. You'd get on really well with him. <laughs> um, the older I'm getting, the more I'm into it. It's funny, isn't it? Yeah. I do enjoy it now. And now I'm thinking, even, okay, I know I, I studied history at uni, but there were even, like, subjects which, as a, as a history student, I was like, oh, God. I want to do these hmm. now I'm finding myself in a bookshop actually the other, the other week I was in a bookshop thinking oh wow yeah I want to know what happened in post-Roman Britain you know <laughs> <laughs> but was, like, yeah. you take me back to being a student I was like yeah. that's the last thing I want to learn about <laughs> yeah. you know no. so boring yeah. but um, yeah so that's a big thing for me um, and then I suppose also I, I quite like um, just I know this sounds a bit, again a cliche but just socialising with friends and family um, in spaces where I'm just Ben Lake. Yeah. I'm just Ben, you know. Um, and uh, I'm lucky that, I, that those spaces still exist. So um, I do that on every occasion that I can. Um, but, it, you know, it's part of the job. You know, you know, when you when you kind of stand, you know it's not a regular role. And, mm-hmm. and it does mean, like, as with many professions, 
it means sometimes your social life has to take a back burner um and that's true and i th- i think both my mum and, and dad worked in roles where that was the case so I, I think i'm lucky in a way that i've seen it was more normal then so it's not sort of it doesn't get to me as much but i know colleagues of mine where it's been tough for them you know the having to take that step back on social stuff and, and oh, missing things like friends weddings or friends birthdays because you know there's a vote or something you know mm. um that's been tough but i think although i yeah i know that it in an ideal world, I would have been to all those stag do's or <laughs> whatever. I also know that I know I made a decision, I made a choice, and I'm taking it seriously, and yeah. and I'll just make I've resolved myself that when I'm not in politics, you know, I'll be there with bells on. Yeah, <laughs> you know, this is it. Whatever the occasion is, yeah. you know, and make the most of it when I'm no longer there. But for now in my life, this is the role. And, and yeah, you're taking small, well, sometimes not, but but sacrifices, isn't yeah. it? Sacrifices not to be somewhere because you've got an important job, an important role to do. Yeah. And, and it's true of all roles, really. You know, they're, they're just varies, isn't it? Of course it is. Yes. No, yeah. It does. You recently it got does. married as well. I did. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks very much. It's all Rats. downhill from here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> jokes, well, jokes, jokes, jokes. I think my, I've lost my, I've another centimetre of my hair. <laughs> <line. laughs> oh, it'll all be gone by next year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where did you go on honeymoon? <laughs> New Zealand. Oh. Yeah. We went to wow, nice. Christmas. Um, so we got married on the 9th of December. I think that's right. Um, <laughs> pretty sure it was nice. Write it down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, went, went back to work as well on, on the following week, which is fine. Uh, and then the week after Parliament was closing up, hmm. uh, so we left. And so we were out um, not far from Queenstown for Christmas. Yeah, nice. Uh, nice. Which was I mean, it's it's a beautiful country. I was so lucky to go there, and um, and you went in the summer then, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. married in December because I, 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 yeah, I think I spent about six weeks there, like oh, maybe three in the fantastic. north and then three weeks in in the south. But it's a great, great oh. country, isn't it? And what we did was we, um, I think I don't think we stayed anywhere more than like three days. Yeah. Hmm. Um. So we were on the move quite a bit, but we wanted to try and see as much as we could. So I think we were there for two and a half weeks, all in all. Um, and we cheated because when we down, went down to Queenstown from Christchurch, we drove from Christchurch down, but then we flew up from Queenstown to save a day of uh, travelling. That makes sense, though, if you're yeah. only there for two and a half weeks. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get the ferry from the island yeah. as well? Yeah, <coughs> that was because I didn't expect that to be you know, a big highlight. Yeah. But actually, when we were leaving um, Picton, I think it's called, isn't it, from the South Island, yeah. um, we were lucky. Although it was a bit rainy, it was kind of misty and quite atmospheric and all the little islands and, oh, yeah. such a beautiful. beautiful country. They yeah. say it's not yeah. like Wales. I, I've never been to New Zealand. Wales Australia. Australia. Yeah. Exactly, Wales and steroids. Wales, yeah. it, that's, I remember describing it when I came back. Uh, did you go to the Remarkables? Yes. Yeah? They were, well, Remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> they were <laughs> amazing, so, isn't it? We went to, as well to yeah. um, Milford Sound, um, which I think, if I'd be pressed, that's probably the, the highlight yeah. What um, was that then? What was so, that? so Milford Sound, uh, South Island, more or less at the bottom, and um, it's I think considered sort of one of the you know the beauty points, beauty spots, and um, the they were explaining to us that the Maori had a wonderful like story about how it was created, and uh, and I hope I'm not misremembering, but basically the the, the Maori gods had a, uh, a a younger brother who was a bit of a troublemaker, just to kind of keep him busy. They'd ask him to kind of um, practice gouging out these big valleys and so he started at the bottom of the south island and he wasn't very good because the valleys aren't clear there's a few islands in the middle <laughs> by the time he got to milford sound it was so beautiful and perfect that he got all of his brothers and sisters around to sit to you know admire it wow and they say that the mountains and you do you know obviously I don't think that's what actually happened. But the mountains, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. have like bum prints, you know, like really? massive bum prints where you could imagine gods are there. Oh. And then the, the final bit of the myth is that um, the the older sister god, and you know, it's typical sister, isn't it? They saw that all the brothers were laying about doing nothing, just sitting around. So uh, she then decided that the place would be plagued with sandflies, <laughs> so that they wouldn't be sitting around doing nothing anymore. <laughs> um, it's just a wonderful way, but it yeah. was such a beautiful place um, with yeah. waterfalls and. And we were lucky that on the day we got there, it was clear. And, and the, we went out on kayaks just to kind of uh, look around. And uh, the person showing us around said, um, this is the first clear day for weeks. Um, nice. And oh, I mean, Lucked out. Yeah, yeah, really lucked out. Lovely. Yeah. I'd love to go to New Zealand. Oh, you should. De- definitely, I'd recommend anybody. Yeah. 
It's, it's just a jet lag when you get there, I remember. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, moving on. Yeah. Have you got any other questions? I want to hit some... Yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, Wales it is in uh, and the Welsh language. Yeah. Are you a Welsh speaker? I am, yeah. You are, and I guess you're a proud Welsh speaker as well. Um, <coughs> what do you want to see happen with the Welsh language in Wales? So I think what I want for Wales, in a way, is a bit of a... Uh, that's going to sound really, really parochial now, but I want it to be like Lampera. <laughs> right? yeah. So growing up in Lampera, right, I remember going to school and... Um, we had a, a Welsh and a, an English stream, um, and uh, I was in the Welsh stream. But then after a certain year, I think when you start GCSEs, everybody's just with each other and it's a bit of Welsh and English. Yep. And by the time you get to sixth form, even though it was an English stream, I had enough Welsh to kind of talk a little bit about it um, and communicate. And then those of us in the Welsh stream, you know, I put this way, I'm not going to win any prizes in the Eastern for my Welsh, <laughs> but I, I consider myself fluent, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it was just that wonderful sort of Welsh and English, both languages are, are, are ours, and there's a bit of English um, as well, which gives its own character. And I think for Wales as a country, what I want to see is that we, we celebrate the fact that we have two languages, you know, that um, both have made equally important contributions uh, to our lives uh, and our history. Um, and I think the Welsh government you know, set this target of a, a million Welsh speakers. And yeah. look, I'm not going to go against it. If we if we get a million Welsh speakers, fantastic. that's around around thirty percent, probably. That's it. it. R- roughly thirty percent of yeah. the population. Yeah. And if we get to that, of course, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. But I think sometimes we need to be mindful of. I go around a lot, and and in the last five years, a lot of people have moved to Ceredigion from from England, right, or elsewhere for that matter. Yep. I only speak to them that there's a lot of interest in the Welsh language and they want to kind of pick up um, a bit of, of the language, but we're still, their ability to do so is quite difficult. Unless they live in the towns um, where there are, you know, Welsh for adults sort of courses, which are really good and really popular, it's not always easy for them. And I remember going down to Llanon, I mean, this time last year it was, and new estate there at the edge of the village. And um, it was crazy, six or seven people in this estate, uh, after each other, said, "Oh, one thing you could do for us is, is uh, improve the Welsh language provision." Oh, sorry, what? <laughs> and they said, "Oh, well, we we really like to learn a bit, yeah. but you know, if it means I have to go to Aberystwyth after work, it's not feasible. You know, it's not. If you could do it in the village, we'll do it once a week, and then we'll have a little bit to get by. So it's almost like make it easy for people to enjoy it and to access it. Um, I think there is always a risk if you." especially uh, for adults, if you start making it something that is mandatory, there's a risk of turning people against it. At the moment, I yeah. feel as though there's a lot of goodwill <clears throat> for the Welsh language. Yeah. And it's about how do you foster that and nurture it further. Um, and then for, for schools, um, I think primary schools, you know, there, are lot, there are a lot of concerns of parents who've spoken to me about it. You know, they might not have Welsh themselves and they worry that the children are speaking Welsh. And, and that's, you know, I think, a valid concern for somebody to have you know the, the worry that they might not be able to help with homework and, mm. uh, well and I, I mean me and my partner don't speak welsh but we we've like learned but i'm very very limited i, I can't really speak welsh but um my children go to the same children that dave said and yeah. it's us all so yeah. they're in a full welsh school and i love it and obviously that was a slight concern to me mm. but I just think, well, it's not about me, it's about them. Yeah. So, but, so but make we are the decision. Learning, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying on to a go. Welsh yeah. course every Thursday morning, 9 to 12. Um, but you, you're, you're still learning Welsh as I, well. I, I was on a Welsh course um, through my work, yeah. through um, Howell Tha. And they were really supportive, and my line manager, to be fair to him. Um, but it was a six-week course of two hours a week. I certainly learned something, but because I blame it on my age now, I'm 41 <laughs> now, and I feel like I need continuous learning. My, like, my yeah. Welsh isn't just going to be like that mm. in six weeks. So it was great to go on that course, but I'd really like to continue. continue yeah. And that's where, risky. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And that's where I think, if we're, if we're um, for the children, what I think is that um, if we can bring them up bilingual, it does, and I know that there, there's, a, there's been a bit of bad press recently in, in some of the UK papers about it, and you know, they, they'll have a pop at how Welsh education results aren't as good as England and what have you. And then they make this lazy assumption that's because it's the Welsh language. I'm thinking, well, hang on. All the countries that outperform the English system are by your trilingual. Yes. So it's not yeah. the fact, you know, there are other yeah. issues and challenges that we need to address in the Welsh education system, right? I'm not denying it's perfect. It's not. 
but it's not actually the Welsh language that's the issue. Hmm. Um, and that's where I think with with um, schools especially, they do a good job at once the child or your children are there, you know, they, they know that it can be a nervous, difficult time for parents if they don't speak Welsh. And by and large, I hope it's your experience as well, the schools will go out of the way to try and address that. And, and to I've had a really good experience yeah. personally as an English speaker and not really you know mega limited in, in welsh and, and they've been really good they've never made yeah. me feel unwelcome and they've always spoke english to me because they can see i can't really un- yeah. understand they've been really good and yeah. that's what i think we yeah. should be doing you know because i want it's not about um clearly i don't want it to be the case that they it's welsh or english we can we can actually give them two languages yes and there's plenty even if they don't um, go on to learn any other languages. That's fine, but they have two languages. You yeah, know? And um, there are things. You know, I think that I, uh, I remember listening to. Um, I think it was Mary Elliot Hopwood, and, and she was giving a talk about how different languages will offer you a different window to look upon the world and and mm-hmm. give you new perspectives, uh, different ways of thinking about things that can help you then with problem solving or dealing with things. And if we can give them two windows, great. But it's also the case that if they want to learn French, if they want to learn German or Chinese or whatever, it's shown that the more languages we have at, at a young age, the easier it becomes to learn yeah. extra ones. Yeah. And, you know, for, you know, that's a wonderful, by accident of history, in Wales, we have two languages. It's yes. amazing. You know, let's pass that on to, to the next generation. And, mm. so, and so I'm not fussed about if it's a million or if it's two million or if it's half a million. What I'd like to see is that our children are given that gift then it's up to society i suppose if it's going to be a, a language that's widely spoken in society then it'll be naturally or not you know you can't mandate something to become a you know the language of society yeah. it, it'll yeah. happen or it won't you can you, you can make sure that people have the ability to do so but you know there will be some pubs in the county that you walk into and you won't hear anything but welsh there are other pubs where it'll be a mixture and other pubs still where it'll only be English. Yeah, and that's of course. fine. It's, of course. It's great. It's fine. You yeah, know, we're lucky we have that diversity. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's what I'd like to see on the Welsh level. Oh, on the Wales level, sorry. You know, so that it's not um, something that uh, we whisper about or we uh, roll our eyes about. It's more of, actually, this is a potential here and it's something that is ours. You know, there, there are not many things in the world you can say, are, you know, uniquely well. No, I know. No, <laughs> I, know, so. I, know. Um, I think it's amazing. I don't really speak the language, or at least I'm learning on trying, but I think it's I think it's amazing. I think it'd be the worst thing ever if it just yeah. sort of died out and, you know. Yeah, yeah I was supposed so. to do my Welsh exam about three weeks ago, but I bottled it because um, I didn't feel quite ready. But I spoke to a colleague who's a first language Welsh and she said, look, don't worry about it. You're learning the language. Yeah. And that's what's important. Exactly. Isn't it? I'm still learning the language. You know, yeah. genuinely, I consider myself as learning the language. And, and another thing as well, for anybody who's learning Welsh and worried, um, sometimes people tell me, oh, I'm, I'm not confident that my Welsh is, is uh, grammatically correct or what have you. Hmm. I always answer them, mine certainly isn't. And I consider myself fluent. And if you listen to Radio 2 or Radio 1 and they do a vox pop in different parts of England, they don't worry that their English isn't grammatically correct. <laughs> no. It doesn't matter. No, it's of it's the spoken language, no. and it is relevant. It's it's valid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the same way for Welsh, you know, uh, you know, there will be different sort of sayings in oh, Cardigan. And there's a good example: the south of Cardigan in Cardigan, the Welsh will be different to spoken in Lampeter, hmm. and the Welsh spoken in Lampeter is different to Aberystwyth, and that's great. That's yeah. Fine. The same way that the English spoken in Berkshire is different to Tyneside. Because <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. and that's Absolutely, fine. Absolutely, yeah. Completely fine, yeah, you know. It is. Um, but we sometimes yeah. get hung up about it. Okay. Got some quick fires for you, Ben. Okay. Are you ready? Hang on. <laughs> Sip a tea. It might not be that quick. <laughs> <laughs> we always go into a debate after these anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, I think I've got all the questions out of the way. Yes. Favourite film? Ooh. <laughs> it's a very niche, but it, it probably is my favourite film. Um, Die Hard 2. Die Hard 2? Yeah. Wow. Remind yeah. me, hang on. Die that's Hard the, One, I know. The airport. Very well. That's the airport, yeah. Yeah, in Die the snow. Hard that's it, yeah. Yeah, I remember. It was on TV a little while ago. I think that's, that's really my favourite. Number I also think, one. So I think that I, I'm one of these people who think that Die Hard One is a Christmas film. 100%. Yeah. I definitely yeah. think it's a Christmas film. Um, but I think just Die Hard Two is just, yeah, I really enjoy that. When he's in um, uh, the baggage packing area, that scene when he's kind of taken out 
was it? <clears throat> yeah. Sort of terrorists or whatever. Um, yeah, totally, totally believable. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, Go on, Bruce. You know, <laughs> and then he doesn't shiver one bit in the snow. You know, no, right? no. But, um, tank top on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's yeah. absolutely fine. He's, he's um, with a beer coat on, maybe. I don't know. But, uh, yeah. It's a good choice. Yeah, Die Hard. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Solid choice. Solid choice. Um, like music or band, what's your go to? So, music wise, I'm a bit of a. Uh, I like a bit of everything. Mm-hmm. So, different styles. Diff- um, yeah, styles. Um, but probably I'll go for Bob Marley mm-hmm. and reggae. I quite really, really enjoy reggae and Bob Marley. Um, also, like Eddie Grant, uh, the electro yeah, yeah. sort of reggae. Th- um, and, that's, um, uh, that's not Electric Avenue. Yeah, it was Electric yeah, Avenue. It was a great yeah. tune. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, it's between them two, I'd probably say. Um, Bob Marley, though. If, yeah, Bob Marley, if I had to name one musician. New film out at the moment, isn't there? Yes. Is, is it out now? Has he seen it? Oh, I haven't seen it. No, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm not sure. But I saw out, the trailer a few weeks ago. Looks really good. Really, quite keen to see that. Yeah. So. His uh, his grandson recently has had quite a big hit. Or, or is it? Yeah. Was it great grand uh, grandson? No, grandson. I, grandson, I, I think. Yeah. Because that is um, Alicia Keys, maybe. Is it the man? Or, anyway, it, it's the grandson, and he's oh had gosh. like a hit song, and it's on like TikTok and stuff yeah, like that. And, yeah. It's like a really big. It's quite good as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite cool. Good. Um, favorite food or like takeaway what's like your Ooh. well I, I favorite food without a doubt um as in because like you know, if i had last meal if i was in death row or yeah <laughs> um last meal uh would be uh three pieces of uh toast with uh mature cheddar cheese melted on it and then baked beans on top i could eat that for every meal hang on beans first no, no, no cheese. cheese first. But, uh, I don't know about that. Cheese. I think you've got that the wrong way around. There. <laughs> oh, no, honestly, so, honestly, I do bake like cheese bacon on, and then yeah. beans on top. Wow. Yeah, I could eat that every day of the week. It is a, that's not it is bad on the wallet meal. either. That's quite oh, good in, try, <laughs> in trying times. That's quite um, quite a good meal to be to be having. I think it's quite good. Good um, <laughs> chocolate bar. Oh, that's a tougher one. As I love chocolate. Um, I'm between, right? If I can cheat, I'll give two. Go on, so yeah, between, go on. Uh, yeah. The Yorkie, um, the biscuit and raisin. Oh, the burgundy Real one. Chocolate. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good that one. one. I yeah. love that one. That's a good one. Um, but then also recently, more recently, I've been um, finding, you know, the small little kinder um, kinder chocolate and other ones. segment. Happy, happy Hippos, you've had one of them? Is it? Is it the, <laughs> Those are nice. They're very good. <laughs> very good as well, oh, actually. The, the yeah. white chocolate on the bottom. Yes. Cho- oh, my kids are into them. The, yeah. little, the little multi-packs. Of That's them. it. The, the, the milk something. Yeah. And it's they, like, uh, like a weird looking kid on the front. Moorish. Or yeah. And you, you buy a pack right? and it's supposed to be like, you know, six servings or whatever. Yeah. And I find myself going back home and by 10 o'clock I've eaten all of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. If there's chocolate in the cupboard, it, it, it's gone in my yeah. house. It's gone. Yeah. Uh, uh, favorite cereal? Oh, I, I eat wheat Bix now, but that's boring. I find classic to, choice. You know, like, <laughs> it's good. But, you know, wheat Bix. But I used to love um, wheat doors. Oh, yeah, Weetos. Uh, Dave, yes. you're a big fan of the Weetos. Big I remember. Fan. Big, big fan of Weetos. <laughs> yeah. And Cocoa Pops. Oh, yeah. No, oh, yeah. That, crazy, yeah. Um, that crazy, like, uh, professor on the pack. Yes. <laughs> Back yeah. in the day. Show me age again. I remember that. Because they remember. probably don't have a professor on the front no, of them anymore. Since <laughs> 1995 or something, probably. No, probably not. Um, yeah, I think I'm done. Yeah, I, I've no. got enough. No, thanks the, the, very much for your time, Ben. No, thank you. I really yes. appreciate and, uh, it. And thanks for everything that you're doing in the podcast. It's really, really important. And uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. On. Cool. Thank you very much.